Well, happy Monday, and welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week. I apologize ahead of time because, as I saw last week, there's a lot of buffering in my video upload, and I think it's because there's a lot more people that are online these days. So I'm looking at my monitor right now, and it's showing a a poor connection, and then it changes to an excellent connection. So a lot of that has to do with just my own internet and the fact that at this time of morning with a lot more people at home, the internet is being used a lot more and this is going to suffer a little bit. So sorry for that, bear with me, bear with all of us as we deal with a lot of extra people online. And I'm guessing you might be one of those people that are gardening and looking forward to getting some good information and maybe you're not normally home on Monday. So welcome to this opportunity to learn a little bit about gardening. If you don't know me, I'm Gardener Scott, and I discuss everything gardening so that you can become a better gardener. Today, I've chosen 10 questions that I wasn't able to get to last week. I'll answer your questions, as many as I can from this week. And then there's some good gardening topics in general that I'd like to discuss moving forward. So let's see who all we've got here. Uh, Nottingham UK, Five Minute Gardener, Daily and Night, good to see you here. We've got uh, Louis Vega from Jersey, The Shores of Lake Huron with Evan5935, uh, Haley Blair says you're excited for today's video. I'm excited too. I've got some what I think is good information to share and uh, hopefully you'll you'll agree with that. We've got uh, Northern Idaho represented by Dalen, uh, Living Life Cleaner with Tabitha. Tabitha, good to see you. Tron is here from Vietnam again. This is wonderful. East Montana, Wayne, welcome. Derek from Alberta. Kathleen from Washington State. We've got um, IQMR from Houston, Texas, and M Go Blue from Snowy, Michigan. I've actually got some good snow or good sun today, and I wanted to start by recognizing something that I think a lot of us might have, you know, overlooked because of all the excitement that's going on in the world. Last week, spring happened in the northern hemisphere. And for those of you from the Southern Hemisphere that might be watching this on replay, your fall began. I think the season change is a big deal when it comes to gardening, but there's so much going on right now in the world that I think it was kind of just forgotten, especially with some of the crazy weather that we're having. Uh, Ramble Ranch from Colorado just joined in, and knows that for us, our first day of spring was snowy and cold and windy. And then you add to that the fact that maybe a lot of us are out of work, we're stuck at home, and we just miss the change of the season. Well, I'm encouraging you to stop, take a deep breath, get all that fear, anxiety, and stress out of your life, and start thinking about gardening and the fact that spring is a major milestone. Many of you are already planting. Maybe you've got seeds started. Some of you are even getting close to harvest. I'm just now getting started with a lot of those activities. So for me and many of my fellow zone fivers, enjoy the beginning of spring because this is the beginning of a whole new gardening season. So enjoy this time change and try to forget some of the troubles in the world right now and think about how great your garden is going to be this year. So Sylvia, glad I'm here. Sick of hearing of COVID-19. Well, that's why I'm doing this. And that's why I think today is kind of a special edition because I want to get your mind off of coronavirus, COVID-19 and actually turn it into some more positive thoughts. And, and what can be more positive than the garden? Because we're starting right now with very little, and before we know it, we're going to be looking back. <coughs> All this virus will be in our rearview mirror, 
and we'll be enjoying our harvests and preserving the food ahead and all those wonderful things. So uh, let's jump right into that. I want to talk a little bit about that concept of using these hard times and making it something positive, not just for us, but for the entire country and the entire world. My video this Friday will delve into this a little more in depth, but I think now's the time to start a victory garden. We're looking for victory from this war that's being fought, and you see this more and more, <clears throat> particularly politicians and pundits are saying we're in a war. Well, in World War I and World War II, when countries all over the world were faced with food shortages and a lot of troubling times, a lot of fear, one of the things that helped us all recover was a victory garden. And the idea was to get regular people, people that aren't normally gardeners, to start gardening. And so for you, especially since you're watching today and you watch the Gardener Scott videos, you're already on your path to being a gardener and having a garden. Well, I encourage you at this point to start sharing a lot of the information that you already have or that you're learning or sharing the information that I am putting out there to get more people gardening, to get more people started with the idea of growing their own food. Because it's simple. I know a lot of you are just beginning. You're newbies when it comes to gardening and you're struggling and trying to figure out what you need to do right. Well, it can start with just a simple pot or a five gallon bucket. <clears throat> Put a tomato plant in a five gallon bucket and you've got a garden. Build a little four foot by four foot bed and sow some peas and spinach and you've got a garden. Take a corner of your yard that gets a lot of sun that maybe you aren't thinking in terms of growing something there and start a garden. Because gardening brings a lot of positive energy to our lives. You know, I, I think I can exemplify just the enthusiasm and the idea of getting in a garden is just so wonderful for me. I know a lot of you share that. So while you're stressed, if you're having to deal with some of those issues in the world, just get outside and garden. Within seconds of putting your hands in the soil, you will have forgotten all about those concerns. And when you start putting the seeds in the ground and you water and you see them grow, a garden takes your entire focus. It takes away all of the terrible, bad things that you might think is happening. And it helps you realize that there are really a lot of good things happening. And the future is bright and your future in your garden is about the most positive thing that you can find. So let's all garden together, let's get through this, and let's share our successes along the way. Or, as I've often said, let's share our failures as well, because that's how we learn as we move through gardening. So Move North Homestead says that you're growing for yourselves and an elderly neighbor couple. That is awesome. And that's exactly the point. The Victory Garden concept is to help the community. It's to help all of us. We take the strain off of this food supply system a little bit when we're supplying our own food. We're increasing our ability to handle some of these issues in the future when we know how to, to grow our own food. But when we can share what we grow with those around us, it makes you a better person and it makes all of us better in the long run. Uh, Heidi Clark says, growing extra vegetables to share with neighbors. Good for you, Hardy, or Heidi. That, that is so wonderful. Um, Haley says, I totally agree. Gardening is a complete escape. Absolutely. I'm retired now, focused on gardening, focused on making these videos. But when I was working full time, even as a gardener at the Galileo Garden, I just loved few things more than coming home and going into my own garden as an escape and as an opportunity to just connect with nature because I loved nature. 
and I like being part of it. I like my garden to be a part of the entire world, and I'm just a small piece in it. Uh, M. Go Blue says gardening is great for mental wellness, and, and that's actually been proven in many studies to improve your mental well-being, garden. And if you don't have a big garden or you don't think you have the, the time, the energy, or the knowledge to garden, just walking into a space that has been identified as a garden instantly changes your mental well-being. It's calming, it's soothing, and I just can't suggest anything better to get you through your day. Uh, Radha says, got three beautiful raised beds to grow more food this summer. That's wonderful. Um, PVC 9X1, I've been so inspired by the plant showing signs of life again. I look at them as a therapy and as a way to get some joy and lightness in such stressful times. Louise Martin, feels good to be here with all of the gardeners. If you've seen more than just a couple of my videos, you know that for me, the philosophy of gardening carries over to the philosophy of life. It's to grow things. It's to make your small world better. And in the process, you make the larger world better. So keep doing it. I'm going to give a lot of information today. I'm gonna to take your questions. And as we move forward, my goal is to help make you a better gardener. And if you can help make your community better, by growing a couple extra plants, a couple extra beds, sharing information with your family and friends, we're all going to be better. So let's start with a question from last week. Uh, we had one from Virginia Hooper. I was talking about hardiness zones. And she said, I'm in Toledo, Ohio, looking at seed packs. I'm in green, May to June. Number, What number of the hardiness zone would that be? And so I wanted to take this question and start off by talking about hardiness zones because this shows a little bit of confusion that maybe new gardeners and some more experienced gardeners might have about hardiness zones. Now hardiness zones, if you didn't see it last week, refer to the average lowest low or the average lowest temperature in a particular area. And of course that happens in winter. So when we talk zone five or zone six or zone seven, that's based on climatological data over a long period of time with the average lowest temperature. And so for me in zone 5B, my average lowest temperature is minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. When you look at a seed package and it talks about when to sow a seed or when to transplant, Many of the larger companies that are producing seed packets, the big seed companies, will put a little graph. They might actually put a map of the United States and it'll be color coded as to when you can start the seed. Or it'll give you color coding and you match up your color coding based on the month. Well, that really doesn't have anything to do with hardiness zones. Hardiness zones are really more focused on growing perennial plants. A hardiness zone will determine if a tree, a bush, or a perennial plant that you put in your landscape can survive the winter. When you look at a seed packet and it's giving you a color-coded map or a reference to when you should start a seed that has nothing to do with your hardiness zone. It's because on those packets that have that information, it's usually an annual plant, a plant that's only going to grow one season, like a tomato or a pepper or squash, usually a warm season plant that can't handle the cold. So if you wanna learn your hardiness zone, it's really quite simple. Just go to Google or um, Bing or one of your search engines and say, what is my hardiness zone? And then put your location, your state or your city. And there's a number of things of sites that will instantly pop up and you just enter your zip code or your city and you can find out your hardiness zone. It's extremely easy. 
But as to sowing the seeds, don't worry about your hardiness zone for any of the vegetables that you're going to be growing or any of those annual fruits. Hardiness zone has nothing to do with it. It's just the calendar and whether your soil temperature is warm enough and your air temperature is warm enough to support the seeds and the plants that will grow. Okay, uh, glad to hear Christopher and Mystic Magnolia. Uh, as new gardeners, I'm so glad that I can teach you and your kids along the way. That's great. Um, Louise Martin in the 1950s snacks in and out of house were raw veggies and fruit. I think that one of the most wonderful things you can do, especially with your kids if you're teaching them gardening, is to go out into the garden, harvest something, wash it off, and then eat it in the garden. I guarantee you will be forming memories for the rest of your life and the rest of their lives. Because as I've shared in some of my earlier videos, one of my earliest memories of gardening is doing exactly that at my aunt's house. In her garden, picking a warm, juicy tomato off the vine and eating it in the garden. I've never been able to recreate that memory to that much satisfaction. So definitely take uh, advantage of that opportunity. <clears throat> And it's not too early to actually get out there. Uh, I had another question um, from, let's see where it is, um, Wyatt Dixon. Any thoughts on cold weather crops? When should I start or when should I stand, plant sweet peas? And Rob OX um, asked a question today about um, a similar topic. And so this gets back to looking at a seed packet and the color coding on it or recommended dates. The most important date that I think most gardeners should be aware of is their last frost date. I've talked that, about that before. I've got a very old, boring video about the last frost date, so I plan on doing a newer one soon. But that's the date that really identifies what plants you can put in the ground. And so before the last frost date, you can still grow plants in your garden. Those plants are cool season plants, or they're also known as cold weather plants. And those are plants that can handle some freezing conditions. And they don't usually need as much sun, and they don't need the heat of the day. And so cool season plants are what we typically think of as true vegetables. We're talking about spinach and radish and beets and broccoli and cabbage. Uh, they're they're the, the plants that you might be growing at the end of your season that actually taste better when they get a little bit of frost on them, like turnips and parsnips. Those are the cool season plants, and you can actually start growing them before your last frost date. Look at the seed package, and it should give you an idea that it'll tell you to sow four weeks before the last frost date. Or if the color coding matches, it might be two to six weeks before your last frost date. I actually started some kale indoors, and I had a question about this last week as well. I've got the kale started indoors, and I'm going to be transplanting it outside within the next week or two underneath some hoops. And the hoops will help keep the soil a little bit warmer, help keep the air warmer around the kale. But kale can easily handle conditions below freezing. In fact, I do have some spinach and some kale that are actually growing in a different bed right now that have been green all winter long. And though I haven't gotten down to minus 15 this year, I've gotten down to zero in my garden. And that wasn't enough to kill the spinach and the kale. So these are plants that are really quite hardy. And if you want to start growing something right now, in the Northern Hemisphere, just about everywhere, you can start thinking about sowing some of those cool season plants. Spinach, for instance, can actually germinate. The seeds will germinate when the temperatures are only 34 or 35 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Now, it's going to take a long time for them to germinate. They will germinate faster when the temperatures are warmer. But the key point is they can still grow when it's cold. So I've still got almost two months before my last frost date. And in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be starting peas. I'm going to be starting some lettuce. I'm going to be starting spinach. I'm going to be transplanting some of that kale. I'm going to put beets in the ground, all of those cool season plants. And if you're not sure about them, think about those plants that maybe you didn't understand or know about the concept of cool season and warm season plants. And so you started some plants, let's say, when it was the beginning of summer. And right away, those plants sent up a stock and it got very bitter. Spinach is a perfect example of this. When it gets too hot, it bolts. It sends up a flower stock and it tastes terrible. Well, if you've grown some plants in your garden that grew very quickly in the summer, and when you went to eat them, they didn't taste very good and there was a flower stock on them, it's probably a cool season plant that doesn't like the heat. So plant them now when it's nice and cool. <coughs> so Evan5935 asks, how do you figure out if annual plants will survive the cold winter and reseed outdoors, like peas or beans, for example. And so a lot of this does come from experience, but there's a lot of information on the seed packet that will tell you. If the seed packet says that you can start it before the last frost date, then you've got an increased chance that it might survive the winter, or at least survive some very cold conditions. If the seed packet says not to start until after the last frost date, then it's a warm season plant that can't handle that cold. So most peas are cool season plants that you can grow before the last frost date. Their life cycle is probably going to be complete by midsummer, but you can plant them again in late summer into the fall and even when there's freezing temperatures in fall, the peas will still grow until their life cycle is complete. And the life cycle being when you're harvesting the pea pods. So plants like peas really aren't going to grow long enough to survive through a winter. Beans typically are plants that are warm season. They can't handle any cold. Again, they have a life cycle that's pretty short. So you can start those seeds in early summer, harvest them in late summer, and they won't even handle any cold temperatures at all. But the plants that have a very long life cycle can often be overwintered. Beets, for instance, or parsnips or turnips. A lot of those root crops take a long time to fully grow. And because they're in the ground, they can actually handle some really cold temperatures. And I've overwintered beets before. You can actually harvest beets well into the winter. And as long as you harvest before the ground freezes, you'll be able to enjoy those root crops, uh, maybe even up into the holidays. Once the ground freezes, it becomes much more difficult to harvest those plants. It's, but even though we think of them as annuals, they'll survive as a root in the ground well into the spring and they'll start sprouting again in spring. Typically though, with a lot of those root crops, they don't make good eating after the winter. They get really fibrous and tough and they don't taste as good. But if you wanna save the seeds from those plants, that's why you leave them in the ground because they're biennials and they don't produce their flowers and seeds until that second Year. So as far as knowing which ones will survive the winter, try it and see. If it's something that cold will kill, it won't survive the winter. But if it's something that can handle some cold temperatures, it can probably handle it. Uh, Louise says, I planted a cover crop of white radish in part of my garden. They survived the winter and eating the greens now as a salad. Great idea. The actual root of the radish might not be as edible right now, but any of the greens of any of the plants that you would eat, uh, spinach, I've actually started 
uh, plucking off some of the small lettuce leaves from the plants that made it through the winter. And they're still quite delicious. Okay, Wayne Kerr, are sprouting seeds the same as regular seeds? I have a huge bag of broccoli sprouting seeds. Will they grow into broccoli if planted out seed, outside? <coughs> um, I'm not sure if I fully understand if you're talking about like you're buying um, broccoli sprouts in a store and you want to plant those, if those are the same as regular seeds, because you can buy all kinds of sprouts. Um, yeah, you can actually plant them and they should survive. However, if you buy sprouts, they've been grown typically hydroponically. So in a water solution with a lot of nutrients and it's been inside in a greenhouse setting. So if you were just to put them outside right away, I'm sure the conditions, the sun, the wind, the soil that they have to now learn to grow in would probably be enough that those sprouts wouldn't survive. A few of them might, but in group they wouldn't. But if you started them indoors first, and so take those sprouting seeds and put them into a potting soil mix, a light potting soil mix with some nutrients, some fertilizers in that mix, you'd probably have a pretty good success rate with those sprouts starting to grow. And then you can harden them off once they've gotten to a few inches tall and then plant them outside. So don't put the sprouts directly in the garden, treat them as you would any other seedling that you would be starting from seed and then put them out as a plant. David Gringus, Gringus, I plan on growing jalapenos in nine inch pots this year because I never quite get enough summer for them. How many plants do you think I can put in one pot? I would only put one plant in a nine inch pot. I'll put two plants in a 12 inch pot. You want the root system to develop as much as possible. And though you could put two plants in a nine inch pot and probably do well with them, by allowing us a pot that size to support a single plant, you'll probably get a bigger plant and more success with that plant by minimizing uh, the amount of space that, or I should say maximizing the amount of space that the roots have to grow and minimizing the competition between them. Okay, let's get back to another question from last week. Ocean Eyes asked, you mentioned shade cloth. Are there many different ratings for shade cloth and how do you select the proper shade cloth? <coughs> and so, yes, there are many different ratings of shade cloth. You can get shade cloth that will block out 10% of the sun, 20% of the sun, 30%, 40%, even 50% of the sun. And much of it depends on why you're using the shade cloth. And so we were just talking about the cool season plants and how they'll bolt or send up their flower stock if it gets too hot. Well, you might want to use a light shade cloth, maybe a 10 or 20% shade cloth over your cool season plants. Let's say you hadn't started any of your peas or your broccoli or any, uh, let's say your, your spinach. <clears throat> and after watching this video and learning a little bit more, you realize you want to do it right now, but you're a little bit late. And so your last frost date comes and now the soil's warming up and it's getting hot outside and you still don't have pea pods developing on your plant. Well, you might want to put shade cloth over those plants to fool them into thinking that it's still late spring and it'll give them more time to develop their pea pods or the broccoli crowns or whatever it is before the hot, hot sun of summer comes. And so shade cloth can benefit the cool season plants early in summer. For those warm season plants, particularly if you're in a really hot region, you might want to do the same thing with shade cloth in the heat of summer. 90 degrees Fahrenheit is an important number when it comes to plants like peppers 
and tomatoes because when the temperature gets above 90 degrees, well, the flowers are going to start dropping off and they're going to stop being pollinated. So put some shade over them. If you're getting into 90, 95 degrees and above and your tomato plants are just starting to flower, well, you can put some shade cloth over them to cool the area around the plant to give those flowers time to pollinate and then start growing into fruit. And so as far as the percentage of the shade cloth, a lot of it depends on how much you want to block out. So for the heat of the summer, I'll use a 30% shade cloth. And I put it just over the top of the plants. And my video on hoops talks a little bit about this, where I'm only putting a strip of shade cloth on the top of the hoop. So in the early morning and the late afternoon, the sun is showing right through to the plants. But in the heat of the summer, when the sun is directly overhead those plants, the shade cloth is cutting down on 30% of that light and heat, and it helps me increase my fruit production a little bit more. Um, Kathleen asked, do you think I could grow sweet potatoes in a bucket for harvest in West, Western Washington? Absolutely. In fact, um, normal potatoes tend to handle some cooler temperatures and they can easily grown in buckets. Sweet potatoes actually, actually require a little more heat and a little bit more sun. And depending on when you start growing them, they may not be fully formed as the summer starts to wane, particularly in Washington where summer can uh, or end and, and fall can begin pretty quickly. And so by growing them in a bucket, that actually gives you the opportunity in late summer, if they haven't fully developed yet, to move them around into fully sunny areas and even bring them inside if it's going to get too cold. So yeah, I'd say give it a try this year and uh, see if you can grow some. Pauline Kelly Wilson asks, I put some tomato seeds that I get from your spoiled tomatoes and they sprout a lot in the bucket. Can I make all of them stay in the bucket? Um, it gets back to that question about growing a pepper in a nine inch pot. Yes, you can keep a lot of seedlings and a lot of small plants growing in a bucket, but for them to develop into full-size plants, you really only want one or two tomato plants per bucket. Tomatoes can actually grow a pretty robust system of roots. So allow those seeds to grow, allow those seedlings to develop in your bucket by all means, but then do plan to transplant some of those seedlings into other pots and then into the ground, depending on how many tomatoes that you want to grow. Uh, F-A-A-E-L asked last week, I took some blueberry plants into my garage this winter. Not sure if it's really going to mess with the chill hours. And so I wanted to bring up this subject as well because it also corresponds to a question that the Mrs. Marvel asked. She said, I planted two apples and a peach tree in 9A. How long after planting should I expect to see new growth? So chill hours is a term that's used primarily for fruiting plants. So fruit bushes and fruit trees. And so fruit trees, like apples, for instance, require some cold temperatures. And depending on the variety, they may require more chill hours than other types. <clears throat> and so if you were to move a tree into a garage, if the garage is cold, it might provide you with enough chill hours that now when the plant goes back outside, it recognizes that it has lived through winter, it will grow, it will bud, it will set flowers, and it will fruit. If a tree doesn't get enough chill hours, it doesn't recognize that it necessarily survived through winter, and it might not set any or many flowers that will set into fruit. So a lot of where you store some of your fruit plants matters. If it's too warm, they might not get enough chill hours, but it depends on what the temperature was. So just to say you put it in a garage, 
doesn't necessarily give me enough information to answer the question. The key is how cold the garage was. And as to when those plants go back outside or when you plant a new tree <coughs> and how soon you can expect to see growth, well, the chill hours also play in as well because a tree, a new tree in the ground is waiting until the balance shifts because at night it's being exposed to chill hours and on cold days it's being exposed to chill hours. And at some point, the genetics within that plant will recognize that there's more heat than cold. The plants recognize that the days are longer, that they're warmer, and that the nights aren't as cold and they're not as long. And so when the plant recognizes that, it will begin to grow. Now, specifically for zone 9A, I can't speak to that, particularly with what the weather is doing these days. But you can expect maybe a couple weeks or a couple months, depending on how fast your area is warming up. I'm guessing in zone nine, it's probably getting very close to the point where if you haven't already seen buds, you'll be seeing buds very soon and the plants will start growing. Okay, um, DI, Ass or die ass. My seedlings are growing crazy. Tomatoes, kale, butternut squash, lots of flowers. I still have eight more weeks before I can plant outside. When should I repot the seedlings into the next pot? <coughs> Diane, I, I think a lot of it depends on the plant, of course. And so look at each of the individual plants. If they're starting to yellow, if the lower leaves are starting to droop, if the plant looks like it's suffering a little bit, it's probably because the roots are becoming a little root bound. The pot that they're in, that they're in is not big enough. So when a plant tells you that it's starting to suffer, that's probably a real good time to repot. You can also back off the calendar a little bit and think about how big the plant should be when you put it outside. So if you want an 18 inch or 24 inch uh, tomato plant going outside, each time you put it in a bigger pot, it's grow going to grow bigger. If you started too early, and it might be a little early on, on your tomatoes, for instance, you can restrict the growth of those plants intentionally. So when you see that it's starting to suffer, delay putting it into another pot so that it doesn't get too big before you put outside. So you have to look at the individual plants, how big they should be when they go outside, and then figure out, are they small enough right now that they can go into a bigger pot and grow bigger and stronger? Or are they growing so big and strong right now that you need to hinder their growth and not transplant them into a bigger pot quite yet? Other plants like kale, kale can actually do quite well with a pretty small pot. I would experiment a little bit and see what you think. And also maybe take a trip to your nursery because in the nursery, you can see the size of pot that they're using and how big the plants are at their respective growth points. So a plant that's really big is going to have a big pot and the inverse is true for that as well. So look around at the nurseries, use them as a guideline, look at the calendar and think about when you're going to put them outside, and then look at the health of the plant to help figure out just exactly when you should transplant. Uh, PVC 9X1, any ideas on what could cause reported tomato seedlings to have curled up leaves? They already had two to three sets of true leaves uh, and were moved back to the same location as before. Um, curling of leaves on tomatoes, the most likely cause for that early in the season is a water issue. And the problem with determining which way it goes is kind of hard because leaves will curl if they don't get enough water and they'll also curl if they get too much water. So do a physical test. Dig a little bit in the soil with your finger to see if the soil at the root level 
is moist. If it's dried out, then you should probably water some more. If it's too wet, then maybe you should cut back on the watering. The curling of the leaves is the plant's reaction to a problem with water because it wants to send its energy to the tip of the plant and keep the tip and the, and the leaves at the tip growing. If water is too wet, the roots can't absorb all the nutrients they need. So the plant will lock out those lower leaves and send the little bit of energy to the top of the plant. So those lower leaves will curl. If the soil is too wet or too dry, the roots aren't absorbing the nutrients and the same thing happens. So that's the most likely cause. There are some diseases called leaf curl in tomatoes, but early in the season, that's not as likely to happen. So look at the watering issue. Also look at wind. If it's been really windy and they're new in the ground, that can also desiccate the plant, dry it out a little bit, and it would need more water. So those are some of the things that you should probably look at and think about. Okay, um, let's go to another question from uh, last week. <coughs> Man Big Pear says he's looking to smother out lawn and expand growing options. And back to what we began with, if you wanna expand your garden this year, and you're looking for some easy ways to expand and add a couple garden beds, but you've got some lawn, one of the easiest and fastest ways to do that is to use cardboard. Just spread some cardboard out on the area where you're planning to grow. Cover that cardboard with soil, compost, organic material, whatever you have, whatever you're going to be growing in. And that cardboard is as effective as plastic sheets when it comes to killing the weeds. It's thick enough that it blocks out all light. It's also thick enough that it's probably going to block out most of the water. It establishes an interface between the old soil and whatever the new soil is that you're growing. And you can start growing right on top of the cardboard and none of the lawn below it will grow through. It might grow around the edges, but it won't grow, grow through that cardboard. And then eventually that cardboard will break down. Now the key here is that you do need a medium to grow in on top of that cardboard because it is going to kill everything underneath it. And I've got a lot of cardboard in my garage and I'll be showing you this in a video to come because I have a large area that I want to kill the grass, grass and then put some new soil on top of it. I'm not going to be planting much in that area this year, but particularly next year after that cardboard is broken down a little bit, it should give me a perfect growing area. Another option is solarization and that's to use plastic. And don't use black plastic, but use clear plastic. So if you place clear plastic over an area of lawn, it will eventually kill everything underneath it. Water the lawn first, put the plastic over. It's important that you seal the edges of the plastic so that you don't get air rolling through and you don't get any additional water rolling into it. And that sealed area, becomes basically a magnifying glass. The sun heats up during the day, warms up the soil, and that plastic helps retain all that heat and even amplify that heat. It will kill the grass, it will kill weeds, but it will also kill all of the soil microorganisms within a couple inches of the surface. So I'm not as big a fan of the solarization because it takes a while for the soil biome to get back to where it should be. And so between the two, I prefer using cardboard. But those, those are both effective ways to start a garden. If you wanna do it now, use the cardboard. If you don't need to grow in it for many months, then consider the plastic, especially if it is an area that has some invasive weeds. Some of those weeds that you can't kill any other way, if you cover them with plastic and keep that plastic on for six months, 
from the beginning of spring to the beginning of fall, you have a better likelihood of killing some of those weeds that you haven't been able to kill any other way. Okay, um, Craig Stephorn Mattadine asks, hey, Mr. Scott, what's your most difficult gardening task? <laughs> the, the thing that just instantly popped to my mind is your next statement. I find thinning seedlings to be my most difficult task. Yes, that's exactly, that's what popped into my mind when you asked what my most difficult task was. <clears throat> For many of us as gardeners, we're trying to get plants to grow. We start them from seed, we fertilize them, we transplant them, we use shade cloth, we use plastic to warm them up. We use all of these different means to get plants to grow. And then we're being told that we're supposed to pluck out plants and kill plants and take away some of these plants that we've spent so much time getting to grow. Yes, that is my most difficult Task. And I, I said that in an earlier video where thinning is just painful for me. But as you've probably heard me say, I've killed more plants than many gardeners will ever grow. And the reason I can say that is because I've grown so many plants. And so many of the plants that I've killed was because I had to thin out the plants. I had to sacrifice some for the benefit of others. I'll use carrots as an example. At the Galileo Garden in the greenhouse one year, we were growing carrots. And as different classes would come in, I'd give the students carrot seeds to spread on a couple of the beds that we had. And one of the beds was about 20 feet long, about 30 feet or about three feet wide. And I had couple different classes coming in and I'd give them seeds and I'd show them how to sow and they'd show, sow the seeds. Well, it turned out that classes were sowing seeds on top of other seeds. And when they all started sprouting, we had thousands of carrot plants and most of them were growing side by side. And a couple volunteers and I spent three full days thinning out thousands of carrot seeds so that the remaining, the, or some actually to, um, carrot plants, because the remaining carrot plants needed to be able to grow. They needed space. That is one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do, is spend three days pulling seedlings out of the ground. Now I added them to the compost, so they did add their lives to future soil, but you just have to do it. You have to thin. If it's hard for you, recognize that if you want a good, strong plant, you might have to kill the plant growing right next to it because they're going to start competing with each other, competing for all the nutrients, competing for sunlight, competing for water. So suck it up, become a killer, and take out those plants that are the weakest so that the stronger ones can survive. Thanks, that was a good question. Uh, Lee asks, what is the best way to get good lawn soil to start growing without buying extra soil? I wanted to start a garden in this challenging time when the grocery stores are not stocked with food. Good for you. And that's what we began with today is starting that garden. Organic material. It's as simple as that. I covered that in my video this last Friday talking about soil and about the only way that you can improve your soil is to add organic material. Now, as to the quickness and how fast you can do it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to improve soil. So if you're looking for better soil, it's going to take some time. You're going to have to use amendments like peat or aged manure or compost and work that into the soil because in the soil, it becomes food for all those microorganisms that plants require to provide the nutrients from the soil to the plant. Add organic material to the surface of the soil. 
add leaves and grass and bar, um, uh, wood shavings or sawdust or wood chips, anything that's organic that can be brought back into the soil because there are many beetles and earthworms and other small animals that will take some of that surface material and bring it into the soil. So the best answer on how to improve the soil is to take your time and add all of that organic material. If you're looking for a quick fix, about the only thing you can do is fertilize. So still plan to do all of that organic amending. But if you're just starting this year and you know your soil isn't very good and you want to get some plants in the ground, it's okay to fertilize your plants. It's okay to give them the nutrients they need artificially while the rest is building up over a period of time. So think about that as a long-term goal. Definitely get some plants in the ground right now. Add whatever organics you can and you might have to do some fertilizers. And think in terms of some natural fertilizers like fish emulsion or comfrey tea or compost tea. I'd rather put the compost in the ground than use it as a tea, but worm castings can be made into an excellent tea in the quantities that most of us have for our worms. And actually, I'll mention right now that my video this Wednesday is about harvesting the worm castings. It's the next in the series of the other videos I did on how to start a worm farm. So I encourage you to do that. If you're new to gardening and you're looking for a way to expand, start a worm farm. And then as you harvest the worm castings, you can make that into a wonderful nitrogen rich fertilizer for your plants. Okay. Um, Big Wave from Florida asks, Hey, Gardner Scott, I really appreciate your knowledge. Thank you. I appreciate you. Did you pick your one seed to grow that you discussed in a previous video? I did. It's a black creme tomato seed, and I've already started filming that process. So in a future video, probably two months from now, I'll show how I selected the seed, how I started the seed indoors, how I transplanted it into bigger pots and then I'll, I'll do the video in um, May because that's when I'll be putting that plant outside. So I'll have this first video showing selecting the seed, raising the seed, and then taking that plant and putting it outside. And then I'll do another video in the future where I'll follow that plant from fertilizing to pruning to trellising to harvesting to actually eating of the, the black creme tomato. And I fully plan to show you how my face changes when I eat a black creme tomato because it's just so delicious. So yes, that is the one that um, I'll be growing. Steve Brown asks, in your soil is the key video, you did not discuss biochar. Could you expound on biochar? You're located in Little Rock, Arkansas. I actually have a video on using biochar in the garden. So look into my library. I did it um, last year, um, I think it was in September of last year. So look to last year for a video on nothing but biochar. I talk about what it is and how to use it. And I'm actually in discussions with um, the man that, that provides my biochar for me. And once all this craziness in the world uh, gets over and calms down a little bit, I'll be traveling to his facility in Kansas where we're going to show how biochar is produced on a large scale. So more biochar videos to come, but I already have one. So I encourage that you look into that because um, I just can't say a lot in just a couple minutes to really talk about <clears throat> how wonderful it is. And I think you'll find much better information there. Um, Okay, uh, Mystic Magnolia, you have so many questions. Is it too late to start seedlings inside for zone 6A? Not at all, but it depends on the plant. So for me in zone 5B, which is very close to 6A, I just started my pepper seeds 
this last week because I'm about two months away from the last frost date and peppers take about two months to grow to the size of a plant for transplanting. But tomatoes only need four to six weeks ahead of time. I like to give them six to eight weeks ahead of time. So this next week, I'll continue with my tomato seeds. I did a couple this week. I'll be doing more next week. So for you, I'd say go ahead and start them this week because it's probably not too late. You're not going to bit, get huge plants, but you can grow a 12 inch tomato in the time that you start from right now to when I'm guessing your last frost date is, which is probably sometime in the beginning of May. And also a lot of those other uh, warm season plants like pumpkin and squash, they can be started outdoors from seed right away. I wouldn't recommend even starting them indoors until you're just a couple weeks away from your last frost date. So yes, by all means, there's a lot of plants that you can grow. Take a look at your seed packets. They should give you an idea of how, how um, soon before your last frost date to start them. And I'll bet you find right now is a good time. Um, Okay, let's see um, what a, a lot of good comments packing back back and forth. Um, Jay asks if I've named my black crim yet. I haven't. Um, I have been thinking about it based on yours and others' suggestions. <clears throat> I'm waiting until it actually develops into a seedling and a plant before I give it its name. Um, I'm not going to get too far ahead of the game. Now, I'll put a plug out there for my son. He's actually having uh, a son of his own here in another couple months, and they've already decided on the name of their son. Well, I haven't done that with my tomato yet. Maybe I'll take his lead. And actually, that's a really good idea. I'm going to think about this. I might actually give my tomato plant a name as it relates to my future grandson. But I don't want to spill the beans of the name that he's chosen because I don't, don't think he shared it widely amongst family and friends yet. So I think I've come up with a name. So thank you for that encouragement. I'll let you know after my grandson is born and I'll transfer <coughs> a, a form of his name to my tomato. Um, thank you for that. Congratulations. I appreciate it. Um, if you've watched my videos and the, the <clears throat> excuse me, the library I have, I have a couple of videos, my seed tape video and my birdhouse gourd video where my granddaughters actually helped me in that video. And I have a couple more videos that will be coming up soon where my granddaughters are helping with those videos as well. Back to the initial point of getting more involved with gardening. <clears throat> get kids more involved with gardening. Get your kids out there, get your grandkids out there, get the neighbor kids out there. It's a great opportunity for them to start learning about gardening as well. They have great fun with it. And in fact, um, my granddaughters were in the third video now that I think about it, the one I did a couple weeks ago about making suet for the birds. They were in that video briefly. They still remember making all of those videos and they still continue being excited about gardening. Do it. They will keep that excitement and those memories for the rest of their lives. So look for more videos. Uh, my grandson lives in Louisiana, but when he gets old enough to visit, <clears throat> I plan on making future videos with him in my garden as well. <clears throat> so I'll oh, thank you for all the congratulations, all of the, the, the good news and good words. Um, it is, it's, there are a few things more enjoyable than having grandkids and, and even kids because it's like a seed. You plant a seed and at some point it fruits. Well, when you have kids of your own at some point, hopefully they'll have kids of their own there will be future gardeners, and then the grandkids just continue that trend for many future generations. Uh, look to my video about 
gardening being the universal or the global language. That was my 100th video. And I talk a little bit about my philosophy behind the zombie apocalypse and how gardening will help us all. And it helps with just us teaching our kids and our grandkids how to garden. So um, that's wonderful. Uh, Jay Dixon says, grandbaby on the way, still a seed in development. Exactly. So let your seeds develop, not just in your garden, but in life as well. <coughs> so <clears throat> let's go to another question from last week. Emily V asks, can you make compost tea from store-bought bagged compost or store-bought hen manure with a bone meal mix? <clears throat> yes, you can. But the big reason that there are so many advocates of compost tea is primarily because of the bacteria within the compost tea. And you may have seen videos where they put aerators, they're pumping oxygen into the compost tea mix to help boost the bacteria population. And they'll throw in molasses to get more bacteria to grow. I think a lot of that is artificial because once it hits the soil, most of that bacteria is going to die. And a lot of that bacteria won't even survive in the soil. So <clears throat> I'll have a video on compost tea. And that's why I say, I think it's better to use the compost in the soil rather than as a tea. But if you're buying bagged compost, chances are it's been sterilized. It's been uh, radiated or maybe exposed to high heat to stop the decomposition because they don't want it rotting in the bag. So a lot of those mixes don't have the bacteria in them. So if you use them to make a tea, the tea will have the nutrients that the compost has because the nutrients through the steeping process will be in the liquid, but it won't have any of that bacterial action. So if you like to use compost tea because of that bacteria, well then bagged compost is probably not going to give you that benefit. Okay. Um, Bonsoir, or actually in bonjour, uh, Matthew Benier from um, Nouveau-Brunswick, Canada. Um, I know a little bit of French. Um, oh, good. Um, you did the seed tape, and, uh, and merci to you as well. Thank you. Um, oh, now I see that you have your English um, translation. <coughs> I actually took French in college. I, I did a wonderful trip to France a few years ago, and I realized I knew enough to survive on vacation. <clears throat> I don't know enough to actually um, converse, but um, I was able to understand um, what you said. So <clears throat> thank you for getting my brain to work a little bit more today. Uh, Never Enough Time says, what soil amendments and fertilizer would you recommend for one year raised beds and new raised beds. And this gets back to exactly what I was saying before. Organic matter, organic matter, organic matter. And much of it depends on what you can get your hands on. If you can get your hands on manures that are well-aged, those can be great amendments for soil, even one-year-old beds, but especially for the long term. Now, I will say about manures, you need to know the source. If you just buy manure or take manure that's free on the side of the road, I might question that because a lot of horse manures um, come from family farms where they might use salt licks. And so that manure might be very high in salt if the horse had the opportunity to lick a salt lick. Or if the people raising the horse uh, used a lot of antibiotics if there was a recent illness. Well, the antibiotics, the salt, it's going to be within that manure. Fresh manure also has the potential of adding some E. coli. So if you've got aged manure more than six months from a source that doesn't have the salt or the antibiotics, manures can be great. 
And that holds true for any other animal that might be supplying you manure. Last week, we talked a little bit about um, cold manures and how you can use things like rabbit pellets. And even the alfalfa that you would be feeding to ra rabbits, you can use those alfalfa pellets as a soil amendment because alfalfa has some great nutrients. The nutrients that would be feeding the rabbits will also feed the soil. Leaves and, and grass and straw are great as a mulch, but if you grind them up into much smaller particles, they can be really good soil amendments. Uh, if you are a user of peat in your garden, peat can be really good for the soil. It doesn't add the nutrients, but it really helps with water retention. And soils that stay moist have increased bacterial action, and that bacteria will benefit your plants. So whatever organic material that you can get your hands on, I would say add that to your soil now and in the future. And especially for a one-year-old bed, because whatever nutrients were in that bed were probably used up, or at least a good portion of them by the plants. So you need to keep adding the organic matter to your soil. Compost is the magic bullet in many cases. That's what I always recommend. So if you've got compost, and in this case, even bagged compost can be beneficial as a soil amendment for your raised beds, even after just a year. So add it this year, add it next year. I like to add a lot of those organic materials at the end of the season in the fall. So they have ch a chance to break down and the bacteria can be in place in the, sp in the spring when the plants start growing, but you don't have to be so concerned about that. It's okay to amend your soil in the spring to get a lot of that decomposed material to get to work for you. Um, oh, okay, David Gringras in French, I understand this. Um, you say you're in Moncton as well. I've actually visited Moncton. Uh, I lived in Northern Maine for a while and I lived in Montana for a while and uh, did a lot of exploring in Canada. So um, it's always good to see uh, our Canadian neighbors watching the channel and sharing the information. Um, Mystic Magnolia asks, what about buying compost from a compost farm? Again, it gets to the source. If the, the compost farm is producing it in mass, I'm sure they can tell you exactly where the material came from and what material they're using. Um, it's probably a lot of manure because manure composts very quickly. And the farms use that as a way to just pump out a lot of compost. So I'll say probably the compost from a compost farm is good. Uh, but check on them, ask them the question. And if they're unwilling to answer the question or they don't know the answer, then I'd probably say um, avoid them. But there's a lot of organic compost farms out there that are very proud of their product and they'll be very glad to share the information with you. Okay, um, still lots of good conversation going back and forth talking about grandchildren. I think that's wonderful. Okay, let's go back to see what we have from um, <coughs> last week. And, and this actually ties in with one of the questions or one of the comments, because Heidi Clark's talking about getting worm castings for the raised beds. Uh, Richard Dankert asks, what is a good alternative to compost when making DIY seed starting mix? And then he answers his own question. What about worm castings? If you don't have compost readily available to work into your seed starter mix or your potting soil mix, but you have access to worm castings, use worm castings. Worm castings is just another type of compost. Compost is broken down by bacteria and worm castings, the same material is broken down by bacteria with the help of earthworms because the earthworms are crawling through the soil, eating the material, and then in their gut, the few enzymes they have work in conjunction with bacteria to create the castings. 
And so it's worm manure. The nutrients are the same as you would have in compost, assuming that the original organic material is the same. But it's broken down even better than a compost pile will break it down. So especially for a seed starter mix where you want a nice light mix for the roots to grow in and potting soils where the roots need to grow, worm castings can be great to add as either in addition to compost or instead of compost. So check out my worm farm videos. The one that's coming out on Wednesday is the third in the series. I'll be doing a fourth in the series in another couple weeks where I show you how to use worm castings in growing plants, seedlings, and then as a tea in your garden. So if you're not doing worms, they're extremely easy and it's something that you can have a lot of fun with, especially as a lesson for the kids, because I think the kids can benefit from learning about them as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> Craig asks, have you ever had problems with bad nematodes? I haven't, uh, but I do know some gardeners near me that have. There are good nematodes and there are bad nematodes. And the bad nematodes, nematodes, particularly in lawns, can really make your lawn look bad. And in the garden beds and vegetables, some of the nematodes can attract the roots and the plants will suffer. So I haven't had a problem with that. <clears throat> but I think part of that might be that I really do try to work to develop good soil. Because as I said in this recent video about soil, if you can increase the beneficial bacteria, the beneficial organisms like the good nematodes, uh, you'll have fewer problems with the bad nematodes. And there are also many other insects out there and microorganisms that will attack nematodes. Uh, and there are some beneficial bacteria that will attack the nematodes. So if you have identified the problem as a nematode problem, uh, just do a little bit of search online and you might be able to find some bacterial support or nematode support. But in the long run, just keep feeding your soil with organic matter, keeping it moist, having a really healthy garden, and you'll probably see fewer issues with the bad nematodes. Um, Liliette Cardoso asks, what about killing weeds before planting a lawn? Um, yes, so it, it, it probably depends on how you're planning on planting the lawn. And earlier when I was talking about solarification, where you're putting plastic over a large area to kill the weeds and kill the weed seeds, that is definitely an option before planting a lawn. <coughs> an issue either with killing the weeds chemically or killing the weeds using plastic, is you're also going to be killing a lot of those soil organisms that are close to the surface. And now when it comes time to plant your grass or start your grass seed, a lot of that beneficial soil activity is not going to be present. So, um, it's often necessary to kill the weeds when you start putting the plants down, but maybe consider a, a different option, like trying to manually kill the weeds, get out there and uh, use a, a hoe. It might take you a long time, but then if you put turf on top of it, any of the seeds that you may have um, exposed to the light, the weed seeds through tilling or hoeing, and then pulling out the actual weed plants. If you put turf on top of that, most weed seeds need light to germinate. And so by putting turf on top of that rough soil, the bacteria and the soil organisms are still there. The turf will block out the light from the weed seeds, and you'll probably have minimal issues with the weeds growing past that point. And then if they do grow through the turf, 
Well, because it's nice, light, loose soil underneath it, not only is the turf going to root faster, but it should be easier to pull out those weeds as well. Okay, Life Goes On asks, is mushroom compost good to fill the raised bed exclusively? I don't really like to fill any bed exclusively with any one thing. Now, mushroom compost will have nutrients. If it's bagged, it probably won't have a lot of that bacterial action, but the bacteria will find it and will grow. But it might be light in some of the other nutrients and some of the um, things that plants need like minerals. And so any compost, as I've said before, is only providing the nutrients that were present in the source organic material. And the same holds true for mushroom compost. Depending on how that mushroom compost was made, it probably has a lot of woody material in it. If you look at the, the ingredients, you'll probably find forest products as a major ingredient. And forest products is just another name for ground up wood chips and bark that come from a forest. Well, the wood chips and the bark will need the fungi to break down and decompose. So all that fungi, all the bacteria from whatever else is in the compost needs to find its way into your soil for it to decompose and for the other soil bacteria to now take those nutrients and make them into forms that are suitable for the plants and the roots. So one single ingredient in any bed is probably not going to give you that well-rounded, well-balanced soil that you need. So I always recommend that you use a blend, a blend of native soil and mushroom compost, or a soil that you buy that's already blended. But try to stay away from a single product, and that includes native soil. Native soil by itself in most areas is not enough to grow plants, which is why I suggest adding things like compost. So always think in terms of blending and adding more things. I, I, I like to think of it as a pizza. Many people like cheese pizzas. There's nothing wrong with that. But think about how much more nutrition you would be providing your body if that same cheese pizza now had peppers and onions and olives and pepperoni and spinach and bacon and everything else that you could pile on a pizza slice and then eat it. You're getting the nutrients from every single component of that pizza, not just cheese. It works the same way in a raised bed. The more different things you can add to it, the better overall your soil will be and the more that your plants will appreciate it. Um, Raymond asked, does caterpillar casting contain the same nutrition value as worm casting? I use it for my basil and they grow super healthy with large shiny leaves. Um, that's an interesting question because here in the United States, or at least in my region, we don't have caterpillar castings. Now I'm guessing that you're in a region of the world where uh, just like we have earthworms that are eating the, the material and producing castings, you're having caterpillars that are producing castings. I can't speak to the nutrition of the casting as compared to the worm castings, but think about the source material. The caterpillars are going to be eating leaves. And so whatever those leaves are, the nutrients within those leaves are going to be passing into the caterpillar and out as castings. So yes, they should be beneficial and provide uh, some nice organic nutrient amendment to your soil and to your plants. I would guess that there's a difference with the worm castings because while the caterpillar is probably eating a single source of leaves, the worm castings are typically made, at least within the home, from a number of different materials. I feed my worms everything from spinach to bananas to peelings from carrots. Whatever my kitchen scraps are, my worms eat. So just like I was talking about with the pizza, 
My worm castings have many more nutrients in them because of the material that my worms are eating. But if you've got um, exposed or the um, opportunity to buy some or use some caterpillar castings, um, by all means, do it. Um, you say you use it by for your basil and they're super healthy. Yeah, my guess is that it's adding some really good nitrogen. It's taking the, the green leaf, which is high in nitrogen, processing it through the caterpillar, probably losing very little nitrogen, and then giving that to your plants in a readily available form. Um, that's a great idea. I'll, I'll look for it. I've never seen it here in the States, <coughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if some entrepreneur doesn't have it available. That's a great idea. Um, Haley asked if you're the only one getting video looping. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. I've actually seen that my stream has been excellent. And so you shouldn't be seeing any looping from my end. Um, a lot more people are on the internet. A lot more people are watching videos. And so there's a lot more slowing, both upload and download. Uh, maybe that might be part of the issue. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, Carol Palmer says, if worm compost is hard to get, you can look into beneficial microbes, part of the Korean natural farming approach. There are ways to make your own with only a couple of ingredients. Thank you for, for mentioning that. It ties in with all of what I've been trying to tie together today. Um, improve your soil, use your microbes, feed your microbes, feed your soil organisms, get all of it working together. And the nice thing about worms, yes, I have worms in my basement to make castings. But if you put organic material into your soil, you will have your native worms find your soil. And now you'll have soil castings permeating the soil because wherever your earthworms are crawling in your soil, you will have castings and it becomes a permanent part of your soil. And it's incredible how they can find what used to be poor soil. As soon as you start amending it, you should see an increase in earthworms. At the Galileo Garden, it was the former site of tennis courts. And the tennis courts were asphalt and they were surrounded by a concrete wall. And that barrier on the outside of those tennis courts varied, but in most areas that, that wall portion was probably between 15 and 18 inches deep. And even more in some areas where the, the posts for the fence were placed. I never thought I would have earthworms in that garden, but I started amending the soil. I started putting all of the organics in place and it took a couple years, but one day I was planting, transplanting some new plants and there were earthworms in the soil. They found their way in, even when confronted by a small concrete barrier. That's because there are many different types of earthworms. There are three primary types that most gardens see. The one we're most familiar with is the earthworm like red wigglers. Those are the type that we'll use in our basement to make our own castings. Well, they only live in the top few inches of the soil. They never go deep. And that's one reason why you don't find a lot of those type of earthworms in cold regions like mine. Because when the ground freezes, it kills those earthworms. But there's a second type of earthworm that survives the winter. Those are what most of us in these cold areas see in our garden. They're bigger than the red wigglers because they burrow deeper. And they can burrow deep enough to get away from that freezing soil and survive through the winter. And then you've got the really big night crawlers. Those can go feet deep into the soil. So even if you've got barriers around your garden area, like I did at the Galileo Garden, those earthworms that can burrow deep, when they discover your soil and discover that your soil is richer than the surrounding area, well, they're gonna find it and then stay there and lay eggs 
and the population will start to grow. So um, it all plays together. The amendments in your soil and the mulches on top of the soil will make your soil better with creatures that you didn't even know existed and they'll find your garden, definitely. Carol says, if you build it, they will come. Absolutely. I've seen it happen and you will see it happen. You have to have some patience. It's not gonna happen overnight, especially with earthworms at the school. I would have the kids collect earthworms, you know, the ones when it's too rainy out and you find the earthworms on the surface of the soil or maybe trying to crawl across a sidewalk. Go ahead and harvest those earthworms and put them into your garden. That's a little bit of a shortcut. Not all of them are going to survive because um, they're probably waterlogged, but enough of them will survive that you can probably plant that earthworm seed, if you will, and get more earthworms in your garden. Steve Doris Miller, do I keep my garlic leaves covered till last frost date is passed? Any other tips on garlic? This is my first year trying garlic. I do have a couple videos on this that go much more in depth. If you go to my library, you can see my video on how to harvest garlic and it, it covers all of this. Um, garlic is one of those plants that can handle cold weather. So <clears throat> I never cover my garlic. Um, and in fact, you should probably be harvesting your garlic before your, oh, I'm sorry, last frost date. I was thinking first frost date. Um, no, uh, they'll, they'll cover, uh, or if you've got mulch over them that covers them, that should be enough. And it's not unusual. My garlic leaves have not started growing yet here, but I've got some more snow forecast this Friday. This week should be warm enough that I'm probably going to see the garlic leaves starting to pop up. And even if I get in a little bit of snow, it's no big deal. It's not going to harm the garlic leaves. They've been living in frozen soil all winter long. So um, you can put a hoop system in place, cover it with plastic that can accelerate their growth and keep it warm. And you might actually be able to harvest garlic a little bit sooner, but it's not necessary. It all comes down to how much effort you want to um, use with that. So um, I, I thought you were asking about um, the end of the season and when the leaves actually start to um, brown and, you, and it comes time to harvest, that's the one I was referring to uh, my my previous video. Uh, but for now, just ensure you have a nice mulch. I, I like about a two to three inch layer of straw. If you've got the mulch in place, you shouldn't have to cover them. Um, Jay says, when people describe me as a gardener, I say that I am a soil farmer. I also um, have exactly a thousand soil tillers, earthworms. Especially in compacted, poor soil, earthworms will make it light and rich. Bring earthworms to your garden. That's definitely a way to do it. Um, Sam Radowick asks, is there a risk with too much wood ash on my beds? Absolutely, for a number of reasons. I have a video on this too. I've got a whole bunch of videos out there. So if you're new to my channel, subscribe, look at my videos and there's a lot more coming out. But I have one that specifically talks about if wood ash is bad for your garden. It is for mine. Wood ash is alkaline. So if you've got an alkaline soil and you're adding wood ash to your soil, you're making it more alkaline. It can reach a point where the plants just won't grow. The pH is just too high. Too much wood ash can cause that to happen. Now, if you have an acidic soil, adding the wood ash can buffer the soil pH, slowly bring it up closer to neutral. But in the process, it's adding potassium to your soil. Pot ash is a term you may have heard referred to as a fertilizer that adds potassium to the garden. Well, pot ash comes from using ashes. Too much potassium is bad for plants. Too much potassium 
in your soil can keep your plants from absorbing other nutrients. So yes, too much wood ash can either raise the pH of your soil too high or add too much potassium to your soil. In both instances, the plants will suffer. I'll ask a question back at you. Why are you adding the wood ash to your garden? If you're only adding it because you've heard it should be something that is added or because you come from a region with very acidic soil, well, check with other gardeners to see what they're doing as far as how much wood ash they're using in their garden. I've said it before, I'll say it many times again, get a soil test done to determine what your pH is before you start considering adding a lot of nutrients to your soil, especially things like sulfur, lime, and the ashes, because they'll change the pH and they may not even be necessary. Just because someone else does it and someone else is suggesting it, doesn't mean you need to do it. So um, learn a little bit about more your soil. And if you see that your plants are starting to suffer in those beds that you've been adding a lot of ash to, that might be a reason. Um, so I see lots more questions that have popped up. We're getting closer to the end. And so I'll, I'll go back over this video. I'll write down some questions from last week or from this week that will be next week and we'll follow the same format where I'll get to this week's questions that I couldn't get to this week, and then we'll have more for next week. <coughs> As we finish up, I'll get back to what I talked about at the beginning and think about a victory garden. Think about expanding what you're doing and think about why you're gardening. If you're not gardening for the enjoyment of it, well then shift your focus a little bit and start figuring out how you can garden so that it is enjoyable. Now, yes, there are failures, it's stressful, it's a lot of work, but go to your garden and just sit this week, today, just sit in your garden, even if it's cold and snowy, and observe the life around you. Last week, I noticed for the first time a robin in my garden. And it happened really close to that first day of spring. So now I'm sitting in my garden, there's snow on the ground, but I see a robin and I hear other birds and a couple bees start flying past. And at that moment, realizing that spring had arrived and I could start my season soon, completely realized why it is I garden, because it's so enjoyable to just be part of nature. This week, I'm building more beds. My back's going to be sore, I'm going to be tired. But when I get to that point where the garden process becomes too hard, I'm sore, I'm sweaty, I'm hot, and I wanna take a break, the best place to take a break is in the garden. So I'll go in and I'll grab a glass of iced tea or iced lemonade and I'll come back to the garden and just sit. It's amazing how the aches and pains just seem to drift away. So in this crazy world we have right now where all around us, we just see the financial aches and pains and the medical aches and pains, just come back to your own personal garden and see if some of those aches and pains will just fade away and grow those seeds and grow those plants and become a better gardener. I thank you today for joining me. If you missed anything or want to see it, watch again on the replay, but I look forward to seeing you here again next Monday, same time, same garden channel. For everybody out there, I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.